Hello and welcome to the Illini Day Admitted Students Virtual Presentation. This presentation is intended for you to watch before our virtual tour and in that way you can ask more detailed questions with our staff and students in the virtual sessions. I am Zach Baran. I am one of our academic advisors and welcome to the College of Engineering at the University of Illinois and welcome to the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering. This presentation is intended to give you an overview of the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering. We will cover some brief introductions here, go over our student demographics, get into the curriculum, and then look at some of our students' projects and what our students do here. Our department is led by Professor Anthony Jacoby, and our undergraduate programs is led by Professor Sanjeev Sinha. We have three undergraduate academic advisors, Missy Beal, who works completely remote, Stephanie Ott Montsevais, and myself, Zach Berent. We also have wonderful support staff with Tammy Smith and Robbie Vermillion. So why are we called MEXI? We're called MEXI for the Mechanical Science and Engineering Department. We are Mechanical Science and Engineering because we have two great undergraduate programs, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Mechanics, which reflects more of the mechanical science side of things, and an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, which reflects more of the mechanical engineering side of things. Although both programs contain a lot of overlap and students have similar career outcomes and possibilities through either of our great programs. So what is the difference between engineering mechanics and mechanical engineering? Well, let's start with the similarities. Both majors share all the same resources. So faculty are all MEXI staff, not designated by major. Staff are all MEXI staff. Student groups, student resources uh, are all for the whole department. All students have access to them. There are also similar student demographics between the two students. So for incoming students, race, gender, uh, scores are all very similar. Um, and in terms of outcome, they have similar scores as well. So they'll have similar placement ratings, um, similar career opportunities, similar, similar salaries. So incomes, outcomes are both the same. It's just more of a different path to get there. So the key difference between EM and ME is that it's a difference in teaching philosophy and student identity of the particular student um, and the courses associated with the two curricula rather than um, anything else. So it's similar outcomes, and, but just two different paths to get there. For example, engineering mechanics students tend to have a, more of a preference to work on simulation and modeling type of work, whereas mechanical engineering students tend to like more of mechanisms. In order to be a great engineer, you need to be able to do both, and both curricula will have experiences for students to see both sides of modeling and as well as uh, mechanisms, but just in general, engineering mechanics students tend to be more on the modeling and simulation side of things. EM students tend to also really enjoy and have a strong fundamental and theory background, whereas ME students and ME classes tend to discuss more applications and dispersion of that theory. EM students, besides being very fundamental, are also more experimental, so kind of thinking far into the future and new and novel techniques, whereas ME tends to focus more on product realization and what is kind of ready for consumers today. In terms of the curricula, EM students pick a personalized secondary field that is very tailored to their interests and can be very specific to really encourage them to um, go forward with what they want to study, whereas ME students, they will tend to more likely than not go for versatility and exposure to different fields rather than a strong concentration. But some ME students choose to do a strong concentration as well. EM students uh, tend to form more of a cohort. It is a smaller program. There's probably around 20 to 30 students in each grade uh, through four years in engineering mechanics, whereas there is about 200 students in ME per grade. 
So because that is a smaller program, EM students really kind of feel more of a cohort and get to know their peers um, more closely. Whereas with ME, it's more about broader connections. Um, just from the size of your classes will be a lot larger. Um, but again, all these students, we consider them MEXI students and we'll network together and you know socialize together. We also think that EM is a better preparation for graduate school, whether that is going into academic graduate schools, research-based grad schools, like a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering, Aerospace, et cetera, um, and going for a PhD, uh, or if you're going for a more professional graduate degree, like an MD, JD, or something like that. Whereas for mechanical engineering students, they typically go into industry more, or they'll complete our MEng degrees, where it's a master's of engineering in mechanical engineering, which are more suited as a master's degree to then go into industry. Now some more demographics about the department. Uh, we have a thousand students in total for both majors, ME and EM. And as you can see here, that means about 860 ME students and 120 EM students. So again, EM, you get that smaller, more cohort feel. We have around 21% female population. Um, and we have a similar, I think around 23% uh, female faculty population. Um, both are on the rise, 11% underrepresented minorities and 20% international. We have an 84% six-year retention in engineering. That means that within six years of their first semester, 84% of our students graduate with a degree from the College of Engineering. So even if they change majors, a good majority of our students will still graduate with an engineering degree. We have an average of 4.0 years to graduate, meaning that most of our students will graduate within four years of uh, when they start on campus. Now, that does not include individual semesters. So for example, many of our students will take a semester off to do an internship or what we call a co-op um, with a company. And so they won't be taking classes, but they'll be learning a lot through a co-op with a company and still graduate in four years. So they graduated technically in four years since they started but really it was only seven semesters. So majority of our students um, graduate within four years, whether that's they graduated earlier or afterwards, around 60% of our students will graduate in exactly four years. Um, around 10% will do four and a half, three and a half. And then the remaining is kind of evenly split between doing graduating in three years and five years. We have nearly 100% pass rate on the fundamentals of engineering exam. We also have nearly perfect job placement and graduate school placement ratings. So 93% of our students, the day of graduation, know what their next steps is. I like to point out that our statistic is saying the day of graduation. So the day of graduation, 93% of our students know what they're doing next. Many additional surveys will look at um, what they're doing six months from graduation. So at the six month mark, we're at 98% um, students having a placement rating, but I think it's more impressive to say that the day of graduation, you know, once all is said and done, our students know what they're doing next. They're not graduating and looking for a job. They're not graduating and then figuring out what to do. They're graduating knowing what they're going to do next. Currently, we are ranked sixth by US National News and World Report. So between the two majors, there's a slight difference in success afterwards, meaning that with EM students, about half of them go into industry right away, and then half of them go to graduate school, whereas with mechanical engineering, it's about two thirds going into industry and one third going to graduate school. And you can see this beginning salary is listed here. Throughout your career at the University of Illinois, you will have access to many facilities across um, the entire campus throughout the College of Engineering, as well as departmental level resources as well. So we have two departmental resources, great facilities, the Mechanical Engineering Building and the Mechanical Engineering Laboratory. Currently, MEB is under a massive renovation um, that will open August 2021. So, you know, within the 
first half of your career at U of I, you'll be able to see this new building. It's going to have so many great additions. It'll have a lot of student focused centers, um, a lot of more active learning and kind of more exciting classroom styles rather than just traditional lectures. There will still be traditional lectures as needed, but we'll have more flexibility for you know, different classes to be taught in a better way. We will also have a lot more maker spaces for students and student projects um, to really have our students get a lot of great hands-on activity. Until then, we are still highly using our mechanical engineering laboratory with a bunch of maker spaces in it as well. So we are very proud of our innovation studio, which is on the second floor of MEL, where students can use our 3D printers, our laser cutters, all sorts of cool things to see um, and get a lot of hands-on experience. Students will use the innovation studio as part of their classes, as part of their you know, student competition projects um, and, our, and student organizations. And some of them will just go in there and have their own personal projects. We see a lot of students who just go in there and will 3D print a phone case just because now through their classes, they've learned how to do that. So we're very proud of all our students and um, we have a lot of great spaces for them to be creative. So we also have a lot of faculty in our department. We have 67 total faculty members, all of which who teach and conduct research and around 22%, 23% female faculty here. Our faculty also additionally run some of the top collaborative research centers on campus as listed here. So we have a lot of students who pursue undergraduate research, around 25% of our students will do undergraduate research at some point. And so it's very helpful to see all our professors and all the different topics that they cover. The way that we like to organize our research is by this research matrix where one aspect of the matrix is societal impact and one aspect is fundamental areas. You can see all of the fundamental areas and societal impacts listed here. Um, and this is very helpful for our students to figure out what professor would be good for them to work with. For example, I knew that I always wanted to go with health and bio. I didn't care necessarily what the fundamental area was, but I knew that I wanted to go into health and bio because my dad was born with a birth defect and I wanted to pursue engineering to help people with a similar condition to my father. So I looked under health and bio, saw all our professors and found the one right for me. Some of our students are more concerned with the fundamental areas. For example, one of my lab mates was very interested in dynamics and controls and looking at manufacturing and robotics. So her, for her, the societal impact wasn't as important. She wanted to just see the various um, professors doing dynamics and controls. She found our professor listed there as well and decided it was a proper fit. So this research matrix is a great approach to help students kind of figure out what they would be interested in and who would be a great professor to work with. So now that we've had an introduction to the department, facilities, faculty, let's get a little bit more information about the MEXI students. So MEXI students apply engineering, physics, mathematics, material science to design, analyze, manufacture, and maintain mechanical systems. We like to think of our students as Iron Man and rescue in the sense that they can really do anything. As you saw from the research matrix, our faculty cover all, all sorts of areas and so do our students. Whether our students are interested in robotics and controls, security and defense, transportation, health and bio, they're able to do that because we give them the proper tools to study fluid dynamics, control, solid mechanics, statics and dynamics, heat transfer, design, all these things. So we are really a master of trades in terms of engineering and a lot of other engineering disciplines and other engineering majors may be more specific and tailored to kind of one of these areas, whereas we kind of cover a good background so that our students are capable of doing all these different things. Obviously, unfortunately, our students really don't become superheroes, but they do go into a lot of different areas. So as you can see here, our students go into uh, you know, robotics and animation, manufacturing, airplane design, vehicle design, large-scale manufacturing processes, 
uh, energy and turbine to the more smaller scale looking at micro nanotechnology lab on a chip using uh, using and designing artificial organs prosthetics orthotics uh, microfluidics as you see here and then the bottom center lab on chip and uh, micro channels for heat transfer in addition to all these more technical routes many of our students also perform go into non-technical fields and so we have many students who will do an engineering undergraduate degree then go to law school medical school my brother just graduated with his uh, JD from law school after pursuing a mechanical engineering undergraduate degree. One of my other friends is getting her MBA right now um, after having a mechanical engineering undergraduate degree. Her students go also into consulting and many more different fields. So Mexi really trains you in having very strong and adaptable skills that you can really go into any field, whether it's technical or non-technical. Now to get into the curriculum for each of our majors a little bit more. So we have two curricula, engineering mechanics and mechanical engineering. You can see there's a lot of similar classes, the kind of circular, circled regions in the figure below show you how much overlap there is between the two majors. So all these regions are in overlap and then the remaining regions are kind of some major differences between the two curricula. And then that last column of electives are free and can overlap and be tailored to the individual student as much as they want. So there are about 90 credits in total overlap. You'll have another 18 hours of general education credits. Um, and then about 12 hours of elective credits on top of that. So really we're looking at you know, around 10 to 12 credit hours are different between the two majors. So first for the engineering mechanics curricula, we'll just cover the overall basics that you'll take a series of math courses and science foundation courses, so physics and chemistry and computer science. You'll take your basic mechanics courses. Um, in here, you'll take a circuits course. You'll take thermodynamics and thermal fluid mechanics. Um, in blue here, you'll take this purple materials course and advanced mechanics courses. So these advanced mechanics courses are really the, the area that's different between engineering mechanics and mechanical engineering. You'll take TAM 470, which is computational mechanics, TAM 412, which is advanced dynamics, and then TAM 445, which is uh, continuum mechanics. So looking to look at things on a curricula and a spectrum. You'll also have some design courses taking ME-170, TAM-270, TAM-195, TAM-252, TAM and ME-470. So with the engineering mechanics curricula, most of the stuff is similar with mechanical engineering. The big highlights are these different advanced mechanics courses that really pro focus and prepare you for graduate school, higher level thinking, looking at experimental work, things like that. In addition to these core required courses, you'll also have your secondary field, um, which is very personalized, focused, and can really help you focus on an application since your curricula is really helping you focus more and get a good understanding of theory in mechanical science and engineering. We have plenty of pre-approved secondary fields like biomechanics, experimental mechanics, computational mechanics, fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, materials, or you can design your own. And we see a lot of students creating their own secondary fields that are really cool. So for example, we've had students who've done a renewable energy design secondary field, combining mechanics with electrical and computer engineering with material science and engineering. We also have students pursuing micro and nano manufacturing techniques. Um, you can also combine pre-existing mechanical engineer uh, secondary fields to form your own for example, we have a lot of students who have done computational fluid mechanics, so kind of combining computational mechanics and fluid mechanics in their secondary field. Now moving on to the mechanical engineering curriculum, it's very similar. So you still see the same mathematics, science foundation, thermal fluid sciences, 
um, basic mechanics and materials courses. Uh, ME has a different design sequence. So this ME170 and ME270 are similar to the ones for engineering mechanics, but we also have these additional 370 and 371 classes for ME students, as well as ME students also have a bigger section within mechanical systems and controls. For mechanical engineering students, instead of a secondary field, they have two MEXI electives and two technical electives. With the MEXI electives, they're there so that students can either get a more in-depth knowledge about mechanical engineering courses or take an interdisciplinary approach to their courses that they know. So for example, I teach a biomechanics course, which is all about um, looking at tissues and experimental tissue, um, it's called experimental tissue mechanics. And so the students have already learned in their materials class, you know, what happens to steel and wood and concrete and plastics when you compress them, when you pull them in tension, when you twist them, when you bend them. My class takes that same material but now applies it to a biological system. So with your knee, or with, with your bone rather, what will happen if you compress your bone, if you pull on your bone, if you bend your bone, what will happen and at what point will it break? With your muscles, with your cartilage, the same sort of things. The students also in mechanical engineering also have these technical electives, which will go outside the areas of mechanical engineering and so the courses available to students between ME and EM for their elective courses, whether that's the secondary field or these MEXI and technical electives, the course selection is still very similar, just the intent is different. For EM students, the intent is that these students are really focusing on an area of interest to them, whereas with ME, the focus and intent is that these courses give the students a breadth of knowledge um, to be more versatile in the end. Now to go a little bit more in detail to the individual course sections that I mentioned before. Your foundational mechanics courses are statics, dynamics, and solid mechanics. I will not talk about these too much in detail because they are very universal. Any other mechanical engineering department across the country will have these courses. Many community college offer for these courses so statics is just sum of the forces equals zero. So, you know, looking at a bridge, how does a bridge work? If I put a load on one end of the table, how will that resultant force, you know, end up on the other side of the table? So nothing's moving, everything is static. With dynamics, now we're including the movement. So for example, with this oil drill, if we're, you know, pumping the drill up and down, what kind of movement does that result in and what will happen to the system? With solid mechanics, we're now looking internally into the beam, for example. With this truck, you know, we have this ATV on a ramp. What inside the ramp, how is the ramp bending because of the lo load on the ramp? The next sequence of classes is thermal fluid sciences. So again, thermal fluid sciences are available at most other mechanical engineering departments across the country. So I won't cover these in too much detail, but we'll have a thermodynamics course that'll teach you how engines work, how um, refrigeration cycles work, things like that. Uh, fluid mechanics, looking at how does water flow in pipes? How does water flow in an open channel like a river or a dam or a canal, as well as how does um, gas and vapors flow. And then we have heat transfer, so really getting more in detail about um, heat transfer principles so that you, know, you can understand how to uh, design insulation, whether you want to separate that heat, you know, in terms of insulation of a house, or you want to use that heat, for example, for uh, solar panels or some sort of design like that. Now onto advanced dynamics and control. 
So this section is largely more focused on the mechanical engineering students versus the EM students. Both students will take a circuitry course so that they understand basic circuitry and programming uh, motherboards. You'll then get into advanced dynamics and signal processing. So with these courses, you're really looking at how to take a mechanical signal and turn it into an electrical output or take an electrical input and turn it into a mechanical output. For example, in this diagram shown below, we have a person walking with an ankle foot orthosis. Um, so basically a boot to help them pick up their toes at the proper time and push down their toes in the proper time of you know, your walking cycle. So you can practice this at home and you know when you're walking see you know you naturally inherently know when to pick up your toes so that you're not dragging your foot behind you um, and when to put your foot back down to make contact with the floor we need to figure out how to do that with signals and sensors so um, that's what these classes will teach you how to do next on to materials and advanced mathematics um, and mechanics so first we have engineering materials, which both students will take um, in both curricula. In this class, you're basically going to break stuff all semester. So you're going to get metal samples, you're going to get aluminum and steel samples and plastic samples and break them. You're going to push them together under compression. You're going to pull them apart in tension. You're going to bend them and twist them and see how they fail, why they fail the way that they do and hopefully get an understanding of how not to have your design actually fail. Then this is more on the EM side of things. You'll look at more advanced modeling, simulation, and computational work with your advanced courses and really understand, um, you know, based on experimentally what you've learned, how, how these materials fail, how to, you know, make that into a larger system. Um, and this is a very growing field and growing trend in research and academia or and industry. You know, for example, here we see a car that has had some sort of impact on it. And, you know, if we're making a car, we're making a design, we're not going to test all thousand different possibilities and iterations of the design because that would be very expensive, very impractical. So instead, we're going to create simulation tools to predict, you know, what design would be best to protect the passengers inside the vehicle and prevent damage, you know, and explosions and things like that. And so we'll create simulation tools to give us a good understanding of how we expect the car to fail. And then we may only end up having to test one model or something. So now to move on to our design sequence. This is probably the most important slide in terms of courses and curricula that I will talk about because the design sequence is the most unique uh, sequence of courses between different engineering curricula at different institutions. So when you're comparing U of I to other institutions, this design sequence is really what's going to stand out between the different institutions and where you'll really see the differences. So to start, we have ME 170, computer-aided design, where you're going to learn how to sketch in 3D software objects so that you can see your prototype in 3D computer software. Next, to move on to 270, that's manufacturing and design. So you'll learn how to actually make the parts that you learned how to sketch in the previous class. So whether that's making them through 3D printing, laser cutting, sand casting, uh, computer controls, different things like that. You're going to get a lot of hands-on experience learning how to make parts. ME 370 is Mechanical Design 1, and I like to consider this course assembly. So you're going to learn how to assemble the parts that you made in the previous class, which you learned how to sketch in the class before that. So you'll learn how to assemble different parts and put them together. And for example, if you go to our YouTube page, you can see, you know, students will create different designs of, you know, here we're showing a uh, tiny walking robot and students have the freedom 
to create whatever robot design that they wanted. The only objective was to create a robot bot to go from point A to point B. However, the students chose to do that. That was up to them. And so you really get to see, you know, the versatility and different ways students can approach the design. And all of these designs accomplish the same task, just in such unique different ways. So it's a really interesting video to watch if you go to our YouTube page. The class after that is ME371 Mechanical Design 2, also known as kind of analysis. So here you're going to, you know, see designs that failed and projects that failed. And for example, with this crane, this crane failed because there was too much load on it. Here we see a gear tooth that snapped off. And so here you're analyzing the designs that you made, that you assembled in the class before, that you learned how to make the individual parts in the class before that, that you originally learned how to sketch in this freshman course, ME 170. So you see the whole sequence of design, you know, starting with, you know, sketching a prototype, then making it, then assembling it together, then analyzing why did it fail. So this, I think, is really the strength of our design program, that it all flows together and it ties in with other courses, but doesn't rely on them too heavily. So you can still progress with the design sequence irrelevant of the other things that you're doing alongside this sequence. Lastly is Senior Design ME 470, which both EM and ME students will take. With our Senior Design, students are working on a real project from a real corporate sponsor that will be something that they're very likely going to be doing once they graduate. And so again, this is one of the strengths of our program and something that we're very proud of, that we're getting real projects and seeing how you will work in industry. Many programs, their senior design will consist of a single project that all the same students will do that, you know, isn't very unique, isn't very, you know, it's not what you're going to be doing once you graduate. And so our senior design program, you're working with real corporate sponsors and we have around 20 to 25 projects each semester. You choose a team based on your interest and we have sponsors from Caterpillar to Ford to Dremel Tools and Bosch Tools to uh, Carl, the local hospital, um, to local startups. You know, the student here is holding a prosthetic that was a partnership with a local startup that helps make prosthetics for people in third world countries. And so you really get a great experience with something that you want to do in your future that isn't just a canned same assignment for everyone that's really tailored and specific to what you want to do with your future. So for example, one of my senior design teammates, we worked with Dremel Tool Company and they were so impressed by one of my teammates that midway through the semester, they offered him a full-time job because they were so impressed with his senior design work. So our senior design class is a really great program and it'll help lead students into kind of their future careers. Now that we have talked about the curricula, let's talk about some of the possible extracurricular and co-curricular opportunities. First, research and independent study. Like I said, around 20 to 25% of our students engage with undergraduate research in some capacity. We have an annual Mexi research fair, which is for students to show off their work as well as for faculty to recruit potential students. You can look at our research matrix um, to get a better understanding of the different areas that our professors um, study. And if you go to some of their websites, you can get more detail about the projects going on with the different researchers. Uh, so we have a lot of students who participate in this and it's a great in order to get a lot of great hands-on engineering experience, especially very early on. You can also get a stipend out of um, the project depending on which project it is and the professor and if they have the possibility to give you a summer stipend um, so you can stay here and take classes 
while you know having some money to have for the summer. You can also get course credit through our independent study program and have it go towards your secondary field or one of your MEXC electives. And it also will provide a great opportunity and great letter of recommendation for any future graduate school or employment opportunities that you are seeking. We also have a lot of competition and projects teams, especially with SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. So SAE is a very big population down at U of I. We have a lot of students interested in automobile design, and this really gets them engaged and excited. Um, and they have a lot of sponsors. A lot of them go on to very large companies. And so um, with this, you can also get course credit for this. Um, but it's a great way to get involved with you know, a lot of hands-on experience. So we have kind of the traditional formula racers here. This is a traditional formula racer. This one's an electric um, racer. So formula electric, you know, using an electric motor. We have Baja off-road vehicles here. We have the um, Eco Marathon car here, where Eco Marathon is sponsored by Shell, and the goal of Eco Marathon is to build the most fuel-efficient car possible. And in this car, the driver lays down through the width of the car, and it gets something like over a thousand miles to the gallon. Obviously, that isn't super practical for everyday use. So there's also the Eco Marathon Urban Concept Car, where you'll build something that's you know more practical for everyday living, um, as shown here. In terms of continuing education, we have several graduate programs that our students you know either continue on here or go elsewhere. So in terms of continuing on at the University of Illinois. We have Master's in Engineering in Mechanical Engineering program, which is a coursework and industry-based master's program. Um, it's not thesis, it's mostly class work based. If you choose to do it on campus and in, as a full-time student, you can complete it in one year, but we are seeing a lot of our students who are going into industry to start working and then we'll continue their education online part-time and we'll see students you know take two or three years completely online to get their master's degree we also have the traditional research and academia based master's degrees and phd programs so ms in mechanical engineering and theoretical applied mechanics so at the graduate level engineering mechanics becomes theoretical and applied mechanics and so both those programs are offered with MS and PhD options. So another aspect of co-curricular and extracurricular activities is study abroad and internships. So first with study abroad, we see students pursuing all sorts of different study abroad options. Some students, you know, have the dream of going to Italy for a semester of study abroad and drinking wine every single day. And that sounds like a great option. <laughs> and if that's for you, go for it. We, but we also see a lot of students who will take a technical semester abroad. And so we see a lot of students who will take a technical semester at a technical university abroad. And that way they won't fall behind in coursework. They won't have to play catch up when they're back here. They will still graduate on time as long as you know they plan out their classes accordingly. And um, it's a great opportunity. If you are interested in doing technical courses abroad, um, we have IPANG, which is International Programs in Engineering, that will you know, show you where the great schools are. For us, the ones that we see students most commonly are UPC in Spain, KTH in Sweden, DTU in Denmark, uh, University of New South Wales in Australia, um, as well as several universities in Japan and South Korea students really have like those experiences. With the European countries, they tend to also have courses that are predominantly taught in English. So you don't even have to um, speak a foreign language to study abroad. So, you know, there's a very, you know, it's very accessible to study abroad and get a great experience at U of I. One advantage of taking a technical semester abroad is that you can 
take courses that we may not offer and the United States overall may not offer. For example, railroad technology is much further advanced in European and Asian countries. And so some of our students who are interested in railroad technology will plan a study abroad semester to really take a lot of electives in terms of railroad technology um, abroad. Similarly, I was just working with a student who is very interested in how we can harvest tides and tidal waves for as a renewable energy source. Unfortunately, if you come here, we're in the middle of Illinois, we're not gonna have any oceans for you to do that. Um, <laughs> so she planned to study abroad at a university that did offer those courses so that she could still go to U of I, um, but would still be prepared for her uh, future. We also have a partnership with ZJUI University in China, and they are completely replicating um, the University of Illinois experience. So if you go there, the courses are the exact same as they would be here. So even if you're worried about, you know, courses mis mismatching and not transferring properly, you know, ZJUI is an option that guaranteed those classes are the same as they are here. Uh, we also see many students do like a semester or a summer abroad where they might either take one or two courses or they'll do like a research program abroad and get credit back here afterwards. Um, study abroad also offers a minor. So a IPeng offers uh, a minor in international studies in within a certain country or culture. Um, so for example, you can get an international engineering minor in Spanish. And so this is very beneficial because some of our students may want to take Spanish and learn Spanish um, as part of their careers, but the actual Spanish minor is very intense and is a lot of coursework. And if you don't come in with a lot of credits or don't want to overload yourself, that can be, you know, very time consuming. It's worth it, but it's a very time consuming minor. So these IPing minors are intended to better overlap with general education requirements so that you can, you know, still get a minor and show, show that you are very interested in this other language or this other culture and are very prepared to work there. Um, but it's just more accessible than, you know, taking 20 additional hours in studying a language. In terms of internships and co-ops, we have many students who do co uh, internships and co-ops throughout their, few, their years here. Um, probably around 75% or more of our students have an internship um, by or after their, or by their third year here. So going into their last year at U of I. It's a great way to get world, real world experience. Um, and traditionally most engineering internships and co-ops are paid. Uh, it'll get you a lot of great experience. Um, it'll help you pursue a full-time job later on. Um, and we have plenty of resources, both at the college level, at the campus level, and at the department level to help you get internships and co-ops. So I got my internship through the department, but we have uh, campus-wide, or we have College of Engineering-wide career fairs every year, as well as campus-wide career fairs every year. Yeah, uh, and here is just some more of our student groups. Like I said, I've already presented about the Society of Automotive Engineers. We have some other projects and technical, more technical based student organizations like Engineers Without Borders, um, iRobotics, Ashray, Hyperloop, Society for Engineering Mechanics. Those are very technical. Um, those, those are very technical organizations and work on a lot of projects, but we also have more networking and broader um, connections, uh, RSOs as well. So we have the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Society of Women Engineers, we also uh, Society for Engineering Mechanics. We also sponsor NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers, uh, SHIP, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, OSTEM, uh, plenty of great networking and opportunities throughout all of campus. So one of the big things 
that we're trying, we like to emphasize is, you know, to really think about what you want your career to be and what you want your future to be and what you want to do, not necessarily that you want your degree to say University of Illinois. And I think, you know, what comes with a degree from the University of Illinois is the, how we prepare you to, to do what you want to do and how do you learn the best and how, what do you want to do? And so hopefully you see that we have so many different opportunities, whether it's coursework, projects, um, research, study abroad, internships, we have plenty of resources out there and it all comes, there's departmental resources for them, there's college of engineering level resources for them, and there's campus-wide resources for you available at the University of Illinois. So um, we have plenty of great opportunities. Hopefully if you have seen that, um, if you have more questions, please you know write them down now so that we're prepared for the breakout sessions later. Um, and here's just a final reminder list of the difference between engineering mechanics and mechanical engineering. Close out, I hope you got a better sense of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois. And just remember that we do the impossible every day.